So the whole building was built 1981 to 1982. Mm -hmm. We moved in to do Return of the Jedi. These, these were the picture editing rooms along here originally. So okay. you'd have a crew that was assembling the picture. And this uh, is like full old style, non-digital with steam backs. It's and... film with a flatbed yeah. cam and maybe a moviola. I remember Batch the optical. Of the optical printer used to sit. The old optical printer. The old used optical to sit printer here. was here. The Linwood. Yeah. I mean, the uh, Paramount Ten Commandments printer was here <laughs> after we left the building. Originally, for in this was Sprocket Systems. There was a a big gold logo here with an S for Sprockets, and uh, the receptionist sat here, and this was our place of business. You know, amazing. So picture editing was that way. Yeah. Uh, administrative offices for Sprocket Systems were up above. And, and that in that spot here, and as you went this way, um, uh, this was the sound department. Engineering was through that way, where right. they were developing, you know, the Holman preamps, THX, building and experimenting with things. It's just an empty room now, but all the uh, scientific and engineering work, a lot of it was done here. This was the uh, sound library. This is like 200 square feet. Yeah, well, the, there were shelves all along here wow. with, with quarter-inch magnetic tapes yeah, in yeah. them, the categories, uh, you know, R2-D2, crashes, fire, arrows, whatever. It's a, it's a, we maintain and built up a gigantic library. Yeah. Um, and then on this wall would be various tape recorders and dubbers. Now, dubbers play film magnetic sound back. Ah. They, they, they have sprocket, it's sprocketed magnetic material. You thread up a reel. At that time, you worked in 10 minute sections of a movie. Each, you'd have you know, each ADR. reel, each reel would be a, about 10 minutes long. Okay. And it, depending on the length of the movie, you'd have, uh, you, you give out assignments to editors. You do reel one, somebody does reel two, or, and so on. It was organized in reels. Uh, and there was a bank of machines here that you could thread up several. Um, reels of sound, be it music or sound effects, in this area is mostly sound effects, that then they could be sent to a mixing console in the room next door, which wow. we'll go next, for mixing. Um, I mean, this is transferring. This is where right, right. if somebody needed some more music to put in the film, they'd, they'd make a copy of it here. How, um, long were you, how long was sound in this room? We were here six years. Uh, we came in to do Return of the Jedi. Uh, worked through Temple of Doom and so on. I think the, la the last film we did here in entirely was Willow. Yeah. So yeah. we did that. We started Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, but that was at a time in which Skywalker Ranch was just starting, and we, we moved out to during and finished Last Crusade out there. Was that like coming out of a chrysalis to go up to the ranch? Did you well, have much better it, it facilities? Well, it was, and... it was duplicating what we had here, but on a grander scale. Yeah, where, yeah. We, where we had that mix room there, mix A, which I love, now uh, the new ranch facility had three rooms yeah. that were equivalent to that um, because they had so much business and they were contracting for outside clients, not just Lucasfilm. Uh, that they needed to have multiple stages. Yeah. And, and so the sound library or anything here was just duplicated on a larger scale. Uh, I, think there were, I think there were 40 editing rooms out there, something like that. Wow, they, could, they could be either picture or sound, yeah. where we really only had a dozen or so rooms here, maybe 15 rooms or something altogether. So uh, this was where uh, sounds would be played back if I needed them for my particular room. It's now a music studio. Oh, it's actually being used. Yeah, right now. Oh my God. There's, there's, okay, there used to be a projector here. Right. Go through that window, so there's a screen. Yeah. Like it's a smaller version of the room right. upstairs. Yeah. But this was just my own private creative space where oh, I wow. could make things. You know, I could I could create mostly Indiana Jones, you know, gunshots yeah, or yeah. spaceships and things like that. And I would generate library material. I would go through the film and let's say there's usually 800 or so projects on a given film, uh, objects, a vehicle or a weapon or something. Yeah. And I would make versions of all of those things and uh, test them out against a scene. Yeah. But then they would go into the library and then editors would come and get them and wow. build all the tracks. It was a, a physical operation that, uh, that required that sort of thing.
All right, Ben, uh, we're standing outside an important room in film history. What is this room? This is where the original Lucasfilm edit droid was assembled and tested. And, and this tested. is the first offline editing system. Right. The, the, one of George Lucas's uh, dreams was to find a way in film technology that you could take advantage of what was happening in video technology. Right. Two different systems. In a film, you had a physical piece of film that had to be cut and spliced and ha handled. Uh, but video, you had the, it being an electronic image, you had the ability to uh, manipulate it. Yeah. There was a, at that time he was thinking about this, it was the very beginnings of computer generated imagery. There was a hint of digital imagery. And so, the, the, and he also wanted to find a way to eliminate the, the legwork of editing, which mostly was climbing up racks of equipment finding a roll of film that you shot, a tiny roll of scene one, take two, bringing it down, unrolling it, putting it on a machine, looking at it. Ah, oh, it's not the one I want. Going back up and, this is, you know, People fire. don't realize that this yeah. is the way film was edited for most of its history with little pieces of film that had to be tracked across right. years of work. It was a physical job of assembly of many little parts. Yeah. Well, the idea behind that was coming across in video technology was if the images could all be put uh, in a uh, computer, yeah. or in, in this case, they were putting them on a laser disc, you'd have random access. You could jump around really quickly and look at all the footage you shot on the set. And so the, the idea behind the edit droid was this was the this was the seed for which all the editing systems we have digitally now came from. The idea of nonlinear nonlinear means you're not just you know, splicing one shot yeah. to another in a rewinds, but you can skip around and randomly find all the shots that you want and assemble them in video. Uh, and then the trick of the edit droid, uh, which was different than all video systems, was it kept track of the frames, the movie frames themselves. Oh. Each one had a unique number. Right. And actually, it related to numbers on that film negative that would had come. So it was traceable. Traceable. So when you were all done, you could the edit droid could um, output a, a list on paper of all the numbers of every frame and where every splice was. That would be given to a negative cutter. Negative cutting sounds like the worst job I can possibly imagine. <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> it's, it uh, negative cutter had to take what was in the camera find every frame exactly the way it was uh, cut in the movie now. Yeah. You're throwing everything else out, assembling the frames. Uh, very, you can't be distracted in that yeah. job. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but the edit droid would then uh, output a list and the, allow the negative cutter to assemble it yeah. back on film so it would be in sync. And video and film run at different frame rates. And they don't quite, they had to. Even when they try to run at the same frame it, rate, they're not quite. Right, they hard, they're not really pals. And, <laughs> oh, pals. oh nice oh, fun, yeah, well that's a, the Video engineers will know that one. But the idea was to come up with a flawless system of, of uh, shooting on film, editing and manipulating on video, and then putting it back on film accurately. And so that's what Editroid was. It, uh, it looked like uh, something like the systems today. Where, uh, there was a large table with a few TV monitors yeah. where you could look at your footage. You, uh, uh, George had an interface design where you could rewind and step through frames and mark where you want to cut. It was, uh, it was well thought out to emulate film cutting as he knew it so that you didn't really have to learn new uh, eye and hand kind of motions to edit. Yeah. You just weren't making splices with a machine with glue or tape I mean, it, it, we started this discussion in, in Mix A in the theater where George not only edited his films but saw future possibilities for making his process faster and easier. Yes. He said he would often say, well, in future we'll be able to do this with blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah. that sounds great, George. Right. But he also put time and money and his intelligence behind this he to put his money change behind film it. history. Yeah, he put his money behind it, which was he developed n numerous companies yeah. uh, to do the things he wanted to see. I mean, I think his goal was he wanted to eliminate the unnecessary labor 
in the post-production process right. that didn't allow you to move quickly, but also the main thing, didn't allow flexibility in recutting. Right. Okay. Right. Of course, we all hate recutting because it's work. But uh, working just in film, let's say you get down uh, toward the end of your process and oh, you have a new idea, you really want to recut right. scenes in the movie. Well, you could do it, but it meant breaking the film apart. Uh, it was consumable material. It yeah. gets scratched, and there's only one copy. Uh, very difficult to make changes. If suddenly you get a new idea. Oh, I have a new idea. I want to add something. In the realm of video and then eventually digital imagery, you now can uh, easily make different versions of cuts and yeah. you can... If you have, a, you, have a, you have been inspired for something, you can quickly make a change. Of course, it drives everyone crazy because now nothing gets finished. You know, until as, the very last Until the, the day before it's shipped. But being able to digitally manipulate footage and cut it, which we can now not only do on our desktops and our laptops, but on our phones, it all yeah. starts here in this It room. starts with this, this process with the Editroid. The Editroid went through a few years of being difficult. Yeah. And, uh, do you know I, what the first film it was used on might have been? Probably one era? of my home movies. Oh, wow. Really? <laughs> I started, I was sort of a test pilot with it oh, because amazing. I was always shooting uh, VHS or Betamax videos of my family, mm -hmm. trips or little documentaries, and I didn't have a way of putting them together. Yeah. So I said, look, I'd like to use the Editroid because I can tolerate the problems it has. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I mean, this is a little distorted, but the fact was, I could go out and shoot video, not on film, but I could come in here with video, cut together little funny documentaries or experimental films, and if it went wrong, I was, nothing was, they weren't. Right, the stakes no, were low. Yeah, there wasn't a client that was upset. Sure. Um, and, and so for a couple of years, I was just generating uh, cuts of things like that. There were other people doing most serious work. They, 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 had, uh, they had gotten some dailies from I believe it was Dallas, one of the... The so, show. So, yeah, the show. Oh, I used to watch it We We had, we had a in. bunch of dailies that we could practice with. So it was a few scenes with the core coverage you'd normally have in a, in a uh, you know, on a motion. They were shot on film. Got it. So it's all the different, the reverses. Yeah, and all the twos shots and for a scene. And we could practice cutting right. and they could see whether the frames come out accurately or maybe they did or didn't. Uh, we had some material we could play with but you know I would do crazy things like uh, I'd record the rifleman you know off TV and I'd come in and just do Chuck Connor shooting people you know so <laughs> you know uh, it just just because yeah. that's who I am so it's uh, and for entertainment purposes uh, and so although there were some serious users testing it yeah. I was I really uh, had fun coming upstairs from my room down below and uh, playing with it. And I loved picture editing, too. Uh, yeah. it, it was something I later got a chance to do a lot more of. The edit droids, um, it was a little difficult. Uh, it was difficult to get established Hollywood film editors to yeah. use it because it, it did break up their habits. Mm -hmm. Hard to break. Uh, eventually, we used them very successfully uh, on the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles. I remember so specifically. So that was a four years of production. About 22 feature-length films came out of it. And we had four, five edit droids working. And, and that, that delivered, and that was shot on film. Yeah. And yet it was going for broadcast TV. And it worked fine. Everything was great. And we were able to do, boy, it, see, it also rippled to new things. Because once we were cutting Young Indies, on essentially on video on the droid, we started to be able to play with images, right. doing split screens, temporary effects, uh, finding out that we could uh, play with what was shot on the set. That like, we could uh, we could put a wall somewhere and eliminate a character. Amazing. There was a day when uh, <laughs> we were we had messed up the we had changed the continuity of a show, and, and George said something like, "Well, maybe we can take that character out." You know, somehow. Yeah. And film, you couldn't really consider that. It's a, and, we found, and in video, we could paste something over or something like that. Once that happened, that was Pandora's box. <laughs> <laughs> that just led to the idea that uh, in the editing room, you could really recompose shots. Right. Things that are common today. You mm -hmm. make a mistake or you get a new idea. You want to, you know, change the size of something right. or add a shadow or, my gosh everything, yeah. remedial work initially, uh, but then you use it creatively, uh, and that led to shooting more with, with non-real backgrounds. 
Good, you know, that's amazing. And all that. So and I could see the seeds of that coming yeah. out of all this. So uh, among remarkable, world-changing technology inventions that come out of this building, this is far from the only one. Pixar also originated in this building. Pixar was born under the roof. Can, of, can we go building. look Let's at go where that Let's go find the, okay. the, the tomb where Pixar was. <laughs> This is Pixar. Graphics personnel only. This is where it begins? It does. Pixar, which we all know today, was a device that was assembled, born, and tested in this room here. The device was overall designed to take film imagery that ILM would shoot, yeah. translate it into the digital realm, scan it in to become digital imagery, yeah. where then you can manipulate it and do all things that only you can do in a digital uh, system, yeah. and then spit it back on, put it on film. So you'd never know that the special effects were done in some other fashion. I mean, it's the very beginnings of applying computer graphics to uh, professional motion picture work, uh, you know, commercial work like Star Wars movies. And, and this comes out of the, am I right, the doctoral thesis work of Ed Catmull and some other geniuses? Well, there I, were, I'm, not, I'm fuzzy on my Pixar I'm fuzzy history. too, but Ed was part of it. Yeah. Uh, a, a collection of scientists, really, those that were pursuing digital imagery at universities and, and other corporations across oh, yeah, the country were assembled, hired by George Lucas to uh, build a device that he wanted to, in order to make that, you know, to, in order to adapt to take what we know about digital imagery yeah. and somehow connected to motion pictures. At that time, the Jet Propulsion Lab mm -hmm. and, and other scientific um, and places were exploring, well, how do you digitize an image? You know, right. what's a pixel? And you know, all the things that we sort of assume common today. I can't speak because I'm not really an expert yeah, on yeah. all of that, but that was all a frontier at that time. So uh, George wanted to apply that frontier, cross that frontier like into this space here. And again, so, it was just him looking to refine his post-production process to allow him the most amount of creativity it, with it, what he shot possible. Exactly, well, you want to be able to, you know, film had its real limits. Yeah. Film, when you do the typical optical effects that were being done, you're, you're copying one piece of a film to another, maybe several times, and it was very hard to get the image to hold up over generations. It yeah. would get fuzzy, grainy, the color would have issues, uh, and you'd see matte lines around people. There were, there were, there were limits, and they had reached those limits yeah. uh, at ILM, really, for much of it. But beyond that, there was then ways you could manipulate an image yeah. digitally that couldn't be done in a normal printer, or optical printer. So getting into that, uh, crossing that frontier into the digital realm was the, his dream, once again. Too. I remember specifically when Star Wars first showed on television, being able to see the, the mat lines around TIE fighters as they were flying The across. contrast changed. Yeah, slight contrast see, change. Yeah, you could them. see the garbage mats uh -huh, that all around uh -huh. things, right. Yeah, well, there was a, they had a re refined process, and it was tricky. It took amazing skill to do what they did. But uh, as we know, digital um, eliminated a lot of the old issues, technical issues, and, and brought in, well, so much now, it's, it's completely changed the business. So Silicon Valley is the specific part of the world where a huge confluence of geniuses started businesses out of their garages, whether it was Hewlett Packard or Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. and there are all these little garage businesses that became huge multinational corporations. But what's amazing to me is that we're in a single building out of which came offline editing, computer graphics, uh, mm -hmm. Photoshop also comes out of this building. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I mean, and all of it is about George looking for ways to refine the process and make it more creative. It is amazing, you know. I, the funny thing about it, when, it, when it's happening, I, I was down the hall, just a, some steps from here, yeah. uh, working on the movies they were doing. I wasn't part of research. Yeah. Uh, and we, we had pride in what we were doing, and we just didn't know what was going on down here. <laughs> we, we said, well, those scientists down there, they're just, you know, we're making movies. Over there. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing an Indiana Jones movie, and, and it didn't take, I didn't take all of this all that seriously. Amazing. I thought it was novelty or something, but then of course, what? Not much time goes by, and we're all working for the guys right, that, yeah, exactly. that invented this, you well, know? Ben, I can't thank you enough for this tour through the building. Uh -huh. It's really, really Well, thrilling. it's fine going. It's full of ghosts, really, Amazing, but really. here we are. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. <laughs>